Thank you, Dr. Anuj, for your kind words of introduction. And uh, thank you, Nita Madam and Team IDEC, for uh, inviting me to this uh, symposium. And uh, uh, I would admit, when given the topic hypoglycemia, I thought there is nothing much to speak for three speakers. And uh, Madam has given me a topic, what will I speak? And then I thought it, then I saw it was in three parts. So I thought non-diabetic hypoglycemia, I thought, oh my God, only insulinoma, that is all I know. And I must tell you, this was 30 years back, my PG question in DNB exam. Spontaneous hypoglycemia, 25 marks was the question. That time I knew one, and till 10 days back I knew only one cause, I must admit. After that I kept on searching, re seeing so many lectures, seminars and everything, and uh, so I've uh, got educated in last 15 days. And I'll try to tell you very quickly, time is limited, as to what I have conceptualized in these 10, 15 days, and how to deal with a non-diabetic hypoglycemia, although it's a postgraduate topic, but I think uh, it will interest you also. So first you have to see whether patient has hypoglycemia or not. They have already, my previous speakers have told you, you have adrenal symptoms, you have neuroglycopenic symptoms, and uh, so, in spontaneous hypoglycemia, you have to first establish whether Whipple's triad is there or not. So that is documentation of low blood sugar, then symptoms of and reversal with glucose. Now, a non-diabetic patient having hypoglycemia, it, it's a real problem for the physician. So two ways to divide it is whether your patient who has come in OPD is seemingly well or he looks unwell, a hospital patient. Now this is the flow chart in Harrison's textbook of medicine, very complicated. And uh, it was, sorry, I'm, this is not running the way, uh, it's, my slide is different and here it is different. I think it's little, maybe one slider difference. Okay. There may be some lag period with this. See, I'm seeing, okay. Matches. Okay, the first thing is to see patient is well or not. Now, it has moved here, but it has not moved there. A little slow, I think. Huh? So you go ahead with yours. Okay, I will go ahead with mine. But you will not see there the same thing. So this is a complicated diagram because I had to go very fast. Okay, so a complicated diagram made into simple. If you have a patient with a hypoglycemia, he is non-diabetic. He is taking no anti-diabetic medication. He is not taking any insulin. Then you have two ways to go about it. The easy thing is to see if the patient is looking well or he is a hospitalized patient in the hospital not looking well. If he is not looking well, you have three important causes. If he is looking well, you have three important causes. So we'll start with not looking well. It will be basically either is critical illness or some hormone deficiency, or it is some tumor which is non-insulinoma, non-beta cell tumor. So hormone deficiency, critical illness, and non-beta cell tumors. These are the three important things that will come up if you have a hospitalized patient. Adrenal insufficiency is a common diagnosis. We see it in patients with type 1 diabetes. Here is a seven-year-old male patient. He is found recurrent, he was found in recurrent hypos. His blood pressure was low. He had postural hypotension. His sodium was low, potassium was low. Blood sugars in the range of 50. Uh, there was hyperpigmentation on the face and the hands. His cortisol level was low, and uh, his uh, uh, synactin test did not raise the cortisol level, meaning that there was adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal antibodies were positive. This was a case of type 1 diabetic going into recurrent hypos, even with decreasing the doses of insulin, and they found that he was found to have Addison's disease. So this is one of the disease. And just for your interest, the famous stand of John F. Kennedy was due to a late diagnosis of Addison's disease. President of United States was diagnosed late with Addison's disease. Infections, second cause, malaria very common. You will see these patients already on falciparum malaria will give hypoglycemia. On quinine, more chances of getting it. Hype overwhelming sepsis is another cause. And then the critical illness. Renal failure, hepatic failure, heart failure. All these will have decreased gluconeogenesis and will have 
these patients can present in hypoglycemia. So th this and third most important cause is the drugs. Getifloxacillin medication was removed from the US market because of hypo. You have quinine, you have indomethacin, levofloxacillin, some signals for artisanate and uh, alpha lipoic acid. So this is simple. Patient unwell, he is hospitalized or he is not looking well. He comes, you see him, either it is critical illness or some crit infections like malaria or some drugs. This is again the lychee crisis at Mazafarpur in Bihar. There was people who were going into hypoglycemic encephalopathy in 2014 and they found out that unripe lychee had a toxin called MCPG and this was leading to this uh, hypoglycemic encephalopathy. So this was published in Lancet and this. The third important cause for getting it is non-beta cell tumor and these are mainly mesenchymal tumors and hepatocellular carcinoma. And why does this happen? There is no insulin, but these tumors are producing uh, insulin-like growth factors which are defective. And so these insulin-like growth factors are not attaching properly to their binding proteins, and as a result, they escape uh, in the tissues and cause insulin release and uh, hypoglycemia. So this 64-year-old male, he had uh, found to be have a glucose of 40, uh, was recurrent, going into recurrent hypos, and see his test here, his plasma glucose is low, his insulin is low, his C-peptide is low, his uh, insulin antibodies are negative, his uh, sulfonyl urea screen, that is the anti-diabetic drug he takes in the urine, there are no detected, still he has hypoglycemia, his insulin-like growth factor 1 is depressed, 2 and the ratio of 2 is to 1, IGF 2 is to 1 is more than 10, that is 22. So the rare cause, non-isolate cell tumors like hepatocellular carcinoma producing insulin-like growth factors, a defective one, which is simulating the insulin uh, receptors and increasing the insulin. This is the CT scan showing hepatocellular carcinoma. Now coming to E, your patient is looking well. He has come into OPD and he says, doctor, I'm getting recurrent hypos. And I checked on the glucometer, it's 23, 30, like that. So first you have to assure that do you have a critical sample? What do you mean by a critical sample? A critical sample where hypoglycemia is documented and you have taken insulin, you have taken the sample for C-peptide, you have taken the sample of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Again, showing you the same thing, three important causes for seemingly well patient, insulinoma, then you have insulin antibody syndrome, and you have a condition called as nesidioblastosis, or it is called as non-insuloma, uh, pancreatogenic uh, hypoglycemia. So these are very rare things. I have also learnt it in the last 15 days only, uh, after being practicing as diabetologist for more than 15, 20 years now. So, uh, so we do what is called as 72-hour fasting test. Now this is a stress test, like for ischemic heart disease, you do a, a stress test, you do this test, you make the patient fast. No patient goes for 72 hours, most of them show up with hypoglycemia in 12 to 24 hours, on maximum 48 hours. And what you measure, you see these patients and when their sugar drops below 55, take the critical sample, at that time take his sample of blood sugar, insulin, C-peptide and beta-hydroxybutyrate and with their various values which are listed here, you, will, you are able to see what kind of disease the patient has. These are the various normal values of uh, uh, glucose and insulin C-peptide you will see in 72-hour fasting and you can compare and see they are listed everywhere on the net. Now coming to the most common diagnosis that the insulinoma. Insulinoma has fasting hyperinsulinemia. Patient is fasting, insulin is more in the body, your uh, beta cell tumors are producing insulin and patient goes into, into uh, recurrent hypos. And this is the most common as physicians we have seen this. But insulinoma is rare. It is in one in a million annual incidence, usually solitary, only 10% malignant, very small, usually less than 2 centimeters, and it is a fasting hypoglycemia. It's so rare, then why are we bothered? because sometimes it can kill the patient, and this is from Trivandrum uh, uh, Institute, Amrita, where there are 10 patients in 10 years out of which two patients died because one had a malignant uh, <coughs> insulinoma. Again, a 39-year-old male, recurrent hypos, 
on occasions he drove his car on the high, on the side walks 12 hour of fasting he was done and he, he saw that his glucose was more his insulin was more his uh, glucose was less 22 his insulin was more c peptide was more that means more insulin being produced in the body and when given glucose he became all right most likely diagnosis insulinoma now what has what is the recent development that has come is how to localize these tumors we had ultrasound ct mri now we have endoscopic uh, ultrasound you go with the endoscope and do the ultrasound and see the uh, uh, pancreas closely you have somatostatin receptor scintigraphy these peptides are tied to the radio tracers and injected in the body uh, insuloma cells take up these tracers they have somatostatin and glp1 receptors and when you make them radioactive they will show the tumors so you have somatostatin receptor scintigraphy you have selective intra arterial uh, you have glp1 receptor scintigraphy and you have a selective intra arterial calcium stimulation test so these are all the new exciting things that have come this is an abdominal scan of the same patient showing uh, 2 millimeter insulinoma at the head of the pancreas endoscopic ultrasound looks like this again shows a 2 millimeter lesion there this is a stomatostatin receptor scintigraphy showing the lesion same lesion there and in the next slide we are seeing a glp1 receptor targeting okay using 68 uh, ga dota extend in 4 scan these are newer things but they are available and they are being done and so even lesion as low as as small as 6 millimeter can be picked up with these uh, with these three. So these are the latest developments that have come up and for uh, surgical, uh, for insulinoma, very, it's a localized tumor, so you do the enucleation, you can do it laparoscopically also. Coming to the last part, very uncommon causes, necidioblastosis and anti-insulin receptor antibody. Again, heard for, heard for the first time and when I search the literature, necidioblastosis or beta cell hypertrophy is seen in, in NICU patients. It is seen in neonates. And pediatric surgeons operate on this, and this is a genetic abnormality. But what we are seeing now after 2005, first described in 1999 by Mayo Clinic doctors, that they are seeing after bariatric surgery, they are seeing these patients going into postprandial hypoglycemia. And they found that the cause is Again, necidioblastosis, which is new beta cells forming in the, near the pancreatic ducts. This patient, BMI 45, was uh, uh, subjected to RU and Y gastric bypass. Uh, uh, BMI uh, came down to 23, but started having hypos. Critical sample showed insulin is more, C-peptide is more. That means something is happening, more of insulin, but negative uh, sulfonylurea screen and uh, uh, negative for antibodies. All imaging tests, including what I've shown earlier, were normal. So a test called selective arterial calcium stimulation test was done. Again, this is a newer test. What they are doing, your, your pancreas has three arteries, splenic, superior mesenteric, gastroduodenal. You are infusing calcium in these arteries, and from the hepatic vein above, you are seeing how much insulin is released. These abnormal beta cells and abnormal insulinoma cells will release insulin if calcium is infused. Normal beta cells will not, in, will not release cell. So you push in the calcium, you see from the hepatic vein in few seconds, whichever territory the, cal, the ca, insulin is rising, that territory the lesion is there. And they saw the splenic artery territory, uh, calcium was rising in the splenic artery territory, the last one you are seeing. And uh, they then resected the part of the pancreas, distal pancreatectomy, and this is the histology. You should see the uh, lower part. You are seeing the bunches of islet cells. So now coming to the last, this is the insulin autoimmune syndrome. Again, very rare, mostly seen in Japanese and Korean patients. You have antibodies to the insulin. Now, if you have antibodies to the insulin, it should cause hypo, it should cause, uh, how does it cause uh, this thing? First, these antibodies uh, bind with insulin, and later on, they release the insulin like a floodgates are open. And this is in, the, in a brief way I'm trying to tell you. And uh, this is a kind of a reaction where first the are, uh, insulin antibody is binding the insulin. Later on, when the blood sugar is falling, it again releases it. And so you get a hypoglycemia, which is quite severe. 
again associated with certain drugs like methimiazole, uh, propyl thiuracil, captopril, alpha lipoic acid. These are the drugs used, first two are used for Graves' disease and then for diabetes. These causes the generation of insulin antibodies. And this causes this rare syndrome of insulin antibody uh, syndrome, first Please described summarize. by Hirata in 1970. Please summarize. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm coming to the last part, reactive hypoglycemia, that is ra uh, rapid transit of food sometimes gives it after gastric surgery, which is, which is easily amenable to treatment. So again, the same slide, three causes for, uh, three causes for seemingly well patient, three causes for patients who are uh, not looking well. And this is how I have conceptualized it, and I've tried to briefly present it. Uh, I thank the IDEC team and I thank the chairpersons for, uh, uh, for giving me this chance.